have a cell phone, I'd ask you kindly to place it into silent mode at this time or turn it completely off. The service will also be live streamed, so I'd like to welcome anybody uh, watching or attending via live stream. Thank you. Services will be conducted by Rabbi Hart of Skokie Valley Agudath Jacob and Rabbi Hamawi of Persian Hebrew Congregation. We'll have the family come, come in now. Thank you. We're gathered here today to remember a man of strength, a man of modesty, a great man, Hyman Burston, Chaim ben Gershon Alevi. I'll provide a brief biographical sketch of his extraordinary life, and then we'll recite a capital to Hillim, Rabbi Nachum Linzer, the principal of Hill Torah, that we'll hear words of tribute from his children and finally, a concluding eulogy by me and a prayer. Hyman was born in Poland, 1931, a small town outside of Warsaw, the youngest of six. He was seven when the Nazis invaded Poland. Because of a trucking company, they were able to move, and they were faced with a decision that would define their lives. Should they go west or should they go east? And they decided to go east, to drive towards Russia, and if we had, they'd gone west, probably none of them would be here now. They left within week, a week of the Nazi invasion, and they made it to Russia. They spent time in Siberia, the family, where they experienced great deprivation, malnourishment, hunger. They kept going east, ending up in Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, and survived by picking up languages, Russian, Kazakhi, in addition to their Yiddish and Polish, and selling on the black market. In those difficult years, they experienced many, many hardships. The greatest was the loss of Hyman's sister, Fagi, to typhus in Siberia, a loss that profoundly impacted his whole life, a beautiful younger sister who he remembered to the very end. After the war, they tried to go back to the Poland, experience the anti-Semitism and the destruction there, the loss, moved to a DP camp in Germany. Hyman discovered two loves of his life, soccer, and Zionism. He became very connected to the Jewish story of the Renaissance and the return to our sacred land in Israel, and that became a big passion of his till the very end. Life in the DP camp was difficult. They moved to Chicago, where they were sponsored by his brother's sister-in-law. A hard life here in Chicago, working in Sinai kosher in the freezers in the salamis, eating salamis, gaining weight, gaining strength, buying an apartment building, and meeting Vera, a blessed memory, in 1957. They married in 1958 and had Jim in 1959. He had no education. He had no money. All Hyman had was his will, his determination, his strength, and his street smarts. And so they entered the business, a laundry, H&V discount, a business that took a long time to build up but became flourishing and successful. And he was there every day, waking up, shaving, push-ups, coffee, butter, sandwiches, kiss to Vera, and then gone, nine to nine, 80 hours a week. This was Hyman, a hard worker, a dedicated worker, someone who believed in family, who believed in life and in some way a believer in Judaism. 
He had a complicated relationship with God and with Torah. In the words of Rabbi Berkovitz of blessed memory, he was perhaps a holy disbeliever, someone who encountered the horrors of the Shoah and war, but still remained connected in his own way and sent children to Hebrew day school, a member at Skokie Valley and Skokie Central, sent children to yeshiva. Hyman sold the business in 1987, retired at 55, and after years of hardship and work could finally rest. He took up tennis, working out, kept his body strong, his mind strong. He didn't need much in those final years, just time in nature, time with grandchildren, eating ice cream and watching sports together. A man of tmimut, of simple strength, a man of humility and toughness, a very unique con combination. And that's whom we're going to remember today. So I want to invite Rabbi Linzer to come forward to recite Tehillim. And following that, we'll hear the words of memory from the children. גם כי ילך בגיא צר מוות לא אירע רע כי אתה עמדי. שבטך ומשענתך המה ינחמוני. תערוך לפני שולחן נגד צוררי. דישנת והשמן ראשי כוסי רוויה. אך טוב וחסד ירדפוני כל ימי חיי. ושבתי בבית אדוני לאורך ימים. It seems like I've been thinking about this day for quite a bit. I, I just so admired him and loved him so much. He was my hero, bigger than life, very tough, very fair in his own way. But I remember one time, um, my father loved to get uh, birthday cards. So I got him uh, a birthday card, or a Father's Day card. I got him a card, and he kind of looked it over. He opened it, and he looked it over, and then he looked at me, and he said, I'm good, but not this good. <laughs> so with that in mind, um, my father was far from perfect far from perfect. He could be very harsh. He, was, he could be very harsh to the ones close to him. He could be harsh on brothers, on sisters, on his wife, on his kids. And, uh, but as time, as time went on, he definitely softened. He, he, there was a whole new aspect to him. Um, and I remember so many fond memories and probably my, one of my fondest memories was of being on Sawyer Avenue and playing cards on Sawyer Avenue. Mira was there, Maury was there, and it was, <laughs> they were loud, they were inappropriate, but damn it, they, they just had a great time. They really did. They, they loved being together, and the laughter, and men in t-shirts, and uh, way too loud, and uh, language which was quite colorful, quite quite frankly, and I think that that's that's the time that I really remember my dad being the happiest when he was around family, and speaking Yiddish, and in those uh, in those situations, I learned I learned from my father to be humble, to be a person of integrity. Um, to say what you mean, try to say it as clear and as straight as possible. It was not a, um, he was not what you would call a deep thinker, but he was very smart, he was very street smart. He, he had great instincts for things. He had great instincts for people. And when I would go to him for advice, I would, I would take what he said very seriously. But there's a part of my dad I also think that you should know, and I think that everybody, needs to know about survivors. And I, I remember one time where my dad was not being appropriate with, with it's not important the, the, 
the, the circumstances, but he got it in his mind about a person and this was going on and on. And then I finally said to him, you're being inappropriate. What is wrong with you? You have this beautiful house, you have this beautiful home, and why are you acting like this? And I said it to him in a way that he could understand. I said, what is wrong with you? You're in the wrong. And he said to me, I, I, just, I just can't help it. See, the, the point is, is that we can talk about what they experienced, but we really don't know what they experienced. And we don't know the way that things were internalized for them. And lots of times I'd see my, my dad sort of in the distance kind of looking out. And I always wondered what he was thinking about. But there was inner toughness. But what shined through and the biggest gift he ever gave me was the gift of laughter. I've never seen anybody laugh like him. His whole being was in laughter. And for that, and for being compassionate, and there was definitely a soft side to him. And there were many aspects of my life, especially turning religious was a big problem. Uh, he didn't like that, but uh, we worked through that. It took about 10, 15 years, but we were able to work through that. And, uh, but as long as you talked to him straight, as long as you were straight with him, he was straight with you, and he appreciated that. And uh, that's something to live up to. Thank you. Um, I remember at my parents' 50th wedding anniversary, some of you were there, and uh, my dad turned to me and he said, life is so good, I don't want it to end. Probably every daughter looks up to her father, the man who shapes her view of men for better or for worse, as you just heard from Jim, sometimes worse. I certainly did. There was a lot to admire. My father was strong, utterly unwavering in his sense of right and wrong. In his view, the worst human traits were hypocrisy, bragging, and proselytizing. Don't you dare try to make him into something he's not. You live your life, let him live his. Decent to the core, in his view, a good man, a good woman, a good person was good even when no one was looking. More than that, a really good person didn't care if anyone was ever looking. Be tough, be modest, be confident, be humble. While he had no formal education, he went to kindergarten in Siberia. Maybe he went to the third grade. He was, in his own way, quite brilliant. In my years working in politics, there is no one who is more accurate in presidential election prognosticating than my dad. He just knew what most people thought, what they wanted, what they believed, and it was because he was that guy. I loved to talk to him and learned so much for him, from him. Since his triple bypass surgery about 30 years ago, I called him almost every day, certain that I wasn't sure how much longer he would last. Thank God he lasted a long time and we had many good conversations. To ask if the war shaped him is like asking if the sun lights the day. It forged his iron will, solidified his sense of character, and created in him a limitless sense of purpose, first and foremost, to care for his family. As you heard, he buried his most beloved young sister, Fagy, by the side of a road in Siberia. That's who I'm named after. That loss seared him to the core and has influenced me too. But while he was shaped by the war, 
he was determined not to let it define him, not to let anyone define him. He lived like that and he died like that. Hyman Burstyn was his own man. While he did say 30 years ago that life was so good he didn't want it to end, I do believe that he would want it to end at this point. He was his own man and he called the shots to the very end. I really think that I'll miss him so much. Um, yesterday, at 4.44 p.m., when my father stopped breathing, my first feeling was astonishment. Up until that moment, I was sure that nothing could stop my father. Not disease, not cold, not starvation, not war. Not a life without a home, not displacement, not a lack of education. Certainly not a new home across the sea, where not knowing the language or the culture were just new barriers to overcome. Nothing. My father was a force. Only death could stop my father. My father was fierce. I'll never forget a particular story. I think Jim was, was there. My father, owned, uh, my father and mother owned a little discount store in East Rogers Park. And generally the neighborhood was, was good. But occasionally, someone would come in and try to run a hustle. On this particular occasion, a customer came to the cash register, paid for his items, and then, when he got his change, claimed that he'd given my father a $50 bill and not a 20 Where was the rest of his change? My father was a careful man. I learned how to count money properly from him, and I learned never to waste, not even a penny. So my father told the man that he was mistaken. He had given him a 20 and not a 50. But the man insisted. After what seemed like several minutes of shouting and threats, George was there too, the man slammed his fist down on the counter and said in a loud voice, if he didn't get his money, there would be, there would be blood. And I'll never forget my father's face at that moment. It changed from a face of appeasement and perhaps a tiny bit of doubt, maybe this guy's right, to a face of determination. He slammed the cash register shut, walked from behind the counter, and forced the man out of his store. He wasn't the first, and he wouldn't be the last to get the same treatment. My father was fair and honest but he wouldn't be bullied or threatened. As a kid, I must have been about 12 at the time, that, same, that scene made a real impression. Stand up for what is right, don't back down, treat people fairly and respectfully, but don't be afraid to take a stand. My father was a survivor of the Second World War, but he always liked to say that he never saw a Nazi. My father and his family outran them. They left Poland in the early days of the war, and by the end of it, they were in Kazakhstan. After the war, they were in DP camps in Germany for six years. 
There was a plan to go to Eretz Israel, but they were told by a close relative that life was extremely difficult there, which it was. They waited a few more years, and by 1951, they were in America. I just have one thing to say about it. My family's early life in the United States. Within three years of arriving with nothing, my, my uncle Maury and his two brothers bought a six flat on Sawyer Avenue where the entire family lived. The selflessness and hard work that made that purchase possible is just one tiny example of the, of the life that my father and his family led and the values that they stood for. When I describe my, friend, my father to friends back in Israel, I sometimes like to say that he was a walking Shulchan Aruch. My father was not a religious man, but he was the inheritor of centuries of European Jewish culture. Yiddishkeit bled from these people. Halacha and Minhagim were part of everyday life from the socialist to the yeshiva bachar. I recently started to learn Mishnah Brura and Orach Chaim for a second time. And I was struck by a Mishnah Brura commenting on a small point in the very first halacha. The Shulchan Aruch tells us that a Jew must arise in the morning like a lion to serve his creator. The Ramah there adds that a person should never make the mistake of believing that he is not constantly before his creator even or especially in his own home. And once a person realizes this, he says, immediately he'll feel humbled by the presence of God and seek to do his will. Adds the Ramah, one should never feel ashamed to serve God, even if people ridic ridic ridicule you for it. On this point, on people mocking your beliefs, the Mishnah Bura points out, that's, that this is even more true in, in, in front of people who are benonim, people who are not tzaddikim, people who are not rishoyim, regular people who are benonim. Why? Because by asserting what you believe in publicly, the Mishnah Bura says, these benonim will learn from you and your actions. That's why my father chased that man out of the store, and that's why he wasn't the only one that he ever chased out of the store. My father never apologized for who he was or how he talked or what he believed in. Integrity was extremely important to my father. I can honestly say that I never saw him cheat anyone. Being real and never putting on airs was also extremely important. He hated phonies. There are so many lessons I learned from my father, but aside from a few overt instruction my father always led by example. He woke up at 8 a.m., did his push-ups and sit-ups, got dressed, ate breakfast, and went off to work. Yesterday, we were adding up the hours that he worked, and as Ravari said, it was something like an 80-hour week. He never complained about it. He never wished for a different life. He was happy with his portion. You got it. <laughs> You got to do what you got to do, he used to tell me. That's what a man does. A man's life can't be summed up in a few minutes, especially a life with so much drama. But I'll carry with me a few important lessons. Be honest, be straight with people, work hard, cherish your family, seek truth, and never back down from a fight. He was a constant presence in my life and will be sorely missed. I'll do my best to teach his wisdom to the next generation. May his memory be a blessing. If I'm being honest, I'd have to admit that, especially when I was younger, our dad was an enigma to me. For starters, we were from two different worlds. 
me a late 20th century day school educated American Jewish kid, and my father an early 20th century Holocaust survivor, labor Zionist who grew up in Stalinist Russia. On top of that, when I was born in 1976, my dad had already lived nearly half his life, a life I did not know. He had already experienced a life's worth of pain and suffering, ups and downs, displacement and struggle. I was now on a slow but steady path to achieving a measure of stability, success, and peace. He was also an enigma to me because he was never around when I was young. He was always working from early in the morning to late at night, nonstop, day after day after day. As I grew up and he grew older, I began to understand and appreciate him more. Yet, as I thought about him, all I could see were paradoxes. He was so tough, yet he could be incredibly charming and funny. He had very simple needs, but was quick to anger if things were not to his liking. He was a successful businessman who idealized socialism. Although he had an antagonistic relationship toward religion, he married a woman, a woman who kept a kosher home and allowed his children to get a Jewish education. We talked about his frugality, but he really enjoyed driving and owning a Lexus. He never owned a mobile phone or learned to use a computer. I don't think he even ever used a credit card. But he was shrewd enough to invest in tech stocks. He was someone who lived on a golf course for 40 years but never learned to play the game. He was someone who loved to watch sports and winning teams, but he was a Sox fan. <laughs> Yet, when I reflect on his life, I recognize that I learned so many lessons from his example. The first and foremost, which was already said, is his devotion to hard work and family. His commitment to doing what was needed to provide for his family made a huge impression on me. That was and is my paragon of what it means to be a father and a husband. The second, which was also mentioned, was his abhorrence towards seeking honor. He detested gaiva, arrogance. I remember the look of scorn on his face when people would publicly make their Israel bond pledges during high holiday services. A third lesson I learned was his incredible strength and tenacity. He was relentless, whether he was hustling goods on the black market in the German DP camp at the store on his feet 12 hours a day or on the tennis court. Chai and I moved back to Chicago in 2007 when we had our twin boys and we ran out of space in our Upper West Side apartment. One of the great privileges of my life has been the years Chaya and I spent have spent in close proximity to my parents, spending time with them, having our children in their lives, and ultimately helping to care for them over the past several years as their health declined and they succumbed to their illnesses. The deterioration started slowly. First, he wasn't able to play tennis. Then he wasn't able to go to the health club. His hearing started to go. His memory lapses became more noticeable. His falls more frequent. We had Hatsala on speed dial. The Skokie Hospital emergency room became a familiar space. But in the midst of Dad's decline, there were also moments that helped me understand him better. There was one time when both when both our parents were admitted to the ER at the same time, and as I was bouncing between their two rooms. Dad and I were rarely together alone, and in that hospital room, he took that opportunity to tell me how much he respected and admired the Jewish family I had built. The children we had, the life we were leading, He understood it, 
respected it and wanted me to know that. He was a person of few words, but he spent an hour telling me this in the ER that day. Later, as his memory loss became more profound, I remember being with him at a rehab facility after he had fallen. I think he had broken his neck. At that point, he didn't really remember much. And I had the pleasure of telling him about his life, about how he was married to the same woman for 60 years, had owned a store, had four adult children who were all married, and that he had he had 12 grandchildren. He was utterly amazed. He, wow, 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 he kept on saying. It was all he could say about the wondrous life he had led. That was all that really mattered to him. Dementia is a cruel and terrible illness. One of the silver linings of the disease is that over time, as dad got sicker and sicker, and more and more of who he was was stripped away, by the end, all that was left of him was his, was his essence. When all the suffering, anger, bad memories had boiled away, what was left was a simple Jew who loved his family, Israel and the Jewish people. At the end, the enigma was gone. At his core, he was someone I could understand and relate to. At his core, I saw in him <laughs> the same things that are at the core of me. And through me and the rest of us, his children, grandchildren, and generations to come, that core will live on forever. May his memory be for blessing. In the Parsha this week, we encounter a crisis, a rebellion, a failed rebellion, and then following the rebellion of Korach, a plague, sickness and death amongst the Jewish people. There's a striking pasuk that I was thinking of as we were sitting together yesterday and last night. V'yikach Aaron kasher diber Moshe. Aaron took the incense. Vayaratz, and he ran. El tocha kahal. He ran to the middle of the community. That's where the plague was. And he put out the incense and made expatiation for the people. And Aaron stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stopped. Aaron stood in between the living and the dead. Two worlds, the world of the living and the world of the dead. And Hyman knew those two worlds. He knew the world of death, the specter of death, of sickness, violence, persecution, was ever present in his childhood and haunted him for his entire life. He saw hunger, he knew hunger, he saw sickness, he saw bombings, he saw death. But he also knew the world of life, the world of vigor, the world of family, the world of creation, the world of will. Rashi on that pasuk says that when Aaron stood, Vayamod ben Ametim, he stood between the living and the dead. Rashi says that Aaron achaz et hamalach hamavet vehemido al korcho, that Aaron grabbed the angel of death. And this is a different image of Aaron. We normally think of Aaron the, the Levi as peaceful. But here we have Aaron physically grabbing the angel of death and telling him, stop! Through that force of his will, 
He stopped the plague. He stopped the death. Hyman would stand up to anybody. If he could stand up to the angel of death to save someone else, I think he would have. He would stand up and fight, not because he wanted to be a tough guy, but because he wanted life so much. I'm reminded of the phrase, Ein davar haomed lifnei haratzon. There's nothing which can get in the way of will. And that was Hyman. Will. Ratzon. And his will was not for kavod, was not for honor, was not for riches. His will was pure. It was for life. Kishmo Kenhu. Like his name, so he was. His name was Chaim, which means life. The word Chaim is a chet in two yuds and a mem. The outside of the word is cham, fire, heat. And there was a heat, there was a fabrentness. But on the inside are the two small yuds, the name of God. A fiery exterior and a godly interior. An interior of sweetness that had to be protected by the fire. But that was drawn out in those later years. Jim shared a story yesterday that profoundly impacted me. As Hyman was laying in his final moments, Jim, you shared that once you asked him, do you love life? And you said that it was hard to picture that he loved life because he was so tough. Could someone who was so tough love life? And he said, of course I love life. I love life so much. And I think the reason he was so tough is because he loved life so much. The only way to love life in his world as a child was to be tough. If you loved it, you had to fight for it. You have to choose it. And that's what he did. In a few weeks, we'll read the famous, famous pasuk from the Torah. Ha'idoti b'chem ayom. Testify before you this day, shamayim ve'aretz, the heavens and the earth, ha'chaim ve'amavet, natati d'fanecha, that life and death I'm placing before you, ha'bracha ve'aklala, the blessing and the curse, and the charge, uva'charta b'chaim, and you shall choose life, l'man tichye ata v'zarecha, so that you and your descendants may live. Choose life, so that you and all of your descendants may live. Chaim chose Chaim. Chaim chose life. And that's really what it all boils down to. That's the simple, profound truth of Judaism. To passionately love life. To fight for life. To give life to the future. And Chaim was a Rebbe in all this. He taught us all, his children and all those who knew him and who are learning from him today, he taught us all to go on, to keep fighting when the road seems impossible. He taught to believe in a brighter future in spite of all the darkness of the past. He taught us to choose Chaim, to choose life. May his memory be a blessing and an inspiration for us all as we transition to a world without him, but a world that is so deeply impacted by him. We'll now recite the Kalmali Memorial Prayer I invite everyone to rise. El male rachamim, shochein bamnumim, hamse minucha nechona, al kanfei ashkina, bemalot kiroshimu teorim. Kezoa Rakia Masirim, Ed Nishmat, Chaim Ben Gershon Halevi, Shalach Le Olamo, Bavor Shanach no meet Palalim Baraskarat Nishmato, Began Ainted the Hemenu Hato, Lachain Balarachamim Yasti Verisik Nafab Le Olamim, Vit Sorbatory Machinishmato, Adonai Unachalato, Vianu Peshalam Amishkavo, Venomar, Amen.
This does conclude the service here at the chapel. Shiva will be held at Allen, Allen and Hyas residence, 9438 Hamlin Avenue in Evanston. Details are on the folders. If you didn't get one when you entered the chapel, get one when you leave. Also, all the information is on our website as well. Interment will take place at West Lawn Cemetery, that's 7801 West Montrose Avenue in Norwich. The procession will be forming in our parking lot. Please keep in mind a few safety features while in the procession. Keep your bright headlights on at all times. Put your emergency blinkers on. Attach the orange funeral sticker to the passenger portion of your front windshield. And we will also attach a flag to the roof of your car. And please stay as close as safety permits to the car in front of you. I'm gonna ask you one more time to rise as the family is escorted from the chapel.